Hi folks, well I've left it far too long, sorry about that, I've been busy, but it's finally time for transparent microchips number three, diodes and photodiodes. So, let's get to work. So, as before, we're going to start off by taking a look at this chip under the microscope and as before, it's a little 2.5mm by 2.5mm square of silicon stuck inside a lead frame carrier mounted in transparent plastic and as before, this one was made by Motorola in 1992 in a project by University of Edinburgh, um, CompuGraphics, Motorola Scottish Enterprise and I think Midlothian Council as well was on the list. But on this chip we've got a total of 13 different diodes. We've got five identical ones down the right hand side and those can be used as a sort of direction of travel sensor or a speed sensor. You can track the light moving across those diodes work out how fast something is moving so we might have a play with that later on. Um, the two on the left hand side are exactly the same but a larger area and these ones, all these seven diodes I've just been through are called deep junction diodes because the PN junction in there is embedded deep in the silicon and the light actually shines through the silicon and the photons penetrate through the silicon hit the junction underneath and that's how you get a, a current developing. Um, down at the bottom we've got another four diodes the two on the left hand side are inside at their own little P-well because the substrate on this is an endoped substrate so they've got their own little P-well so they're kind of the reverse chemistry to the rest of them and the two on the right hand side are deep junction diodes like the first bunch were but they've got a layer of metal over the top of them so that they're not sensitive to light so you can check out the effects on those ones as well and uh, the same with D4 there in the middle um, these ones here that look kind of like thin film resistors are what are called edge diodes and they have the most of the diode covered over with the metal layer that makes the contact up to pins P13 and P14 there and uh, they rely on light penetrating around the side of the silicon to actually get the photoelectric effect and uh, just a, a quick look here so Pin P11 there is the substrate connection, that goes to the metal layer that covers pretty much all of the silicon that isn't being used. And uh, one contact of the diode, so for example on this one here, D1, um, the contact to the diode is that ring around the outside because the centre has to be kept transparent obviously or open so that light can get into it. And the other contact on the diode is the underside of it and off to the substrate. So I think that's enough for this bit, um, let's get on with some experiments. Okay, I thought I'd start off by trying to characterise some of these diodes. So I'm going to plot current voltage curves for a couple of those and then I'll try these big D1 and D2 as well and uh, see what the graphs look like for them. I mean these should all be identical since they're identical portions of silicon but we'll find out what the effect of having a larger body area is. Okay, so just so you can see the setup, I've got D13 over in the corner here, which is D13 on this diagram here, connected between pins 10 on the positive and 11 for the ground connection. And um, I've got a bit of black insulation tape that I can put over the chip just to stop the light getting in, so we're not measuring the optical effects. And then I'm using my power supply to supply highly controlled voltage, and since the uh, current measurement on that isn't exactly spot on, I'm using my high precision Keithley bench meter to measure the current. And I'm just going to step up through the voltage, so 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, we're starting to get a bit of current flowing, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, we're up to ooh, a tenth of a milliamp there. And at 0.7 volts we're hitting 1.3 milliamps and 0.77 volts we're hitting 3.7 milliamps. So I'm going to plot a graph of that and um, do it a bit more controlled than what I've just shown you there. I'm also getting a second set of current curves for brightly lit conditions where I've just got my LED torch 900 lumen sat straight on top of the chip. 
Okay, it's a couple of hours later now and the results are in. Um, I did the dark current and light current for five different diodes in total. So this first one on the graph is diode D13, this one up in the top corner. And uh, one of the interesting things I noticed that when it's in strong light we're actually getting a negative current generated because this thing's acting as a little solar cell. We're pushing the electrons off our diode using photons from the torch. So up until we hit about 0 0.5 volts you can see we're actually pushing a current out of the diode and back through the circuitry of my two different multimeters or the bench power supply and the um, bench multimeter. And anyway here's the curves for it. So in total darkness we follow the blue line and when we've got some light shining on it we get a bit more current flowing than we did before. Um, underneath this we've got diode D2 which was this one over here, twice the size of D13 and um, similar sort of affair I noticed that we're getting a higher current from our solar panel effect um, photoelectric effect? Yeah, whichever. Um, we're getting a slightly higher current this time. It's still minuscule, I mean fractions of a milliamp, but we're getting a little bit more current. But um, I'm very curious because this particular diode, which is twice the size, is actually passing less current and the uh, photonic effect with it is much less pronounced, particularly at higher current levels. So not really sure what was going on with that. Um, next up we've got diode D1, which was this big one here, and diode D1 is generating a lot more current when it's getting the light shining on it. We're actually up to 0.13 of a milliamp there, and um, we get much higher currents flowing, and this photo effect is much more pronounced. The current difference between darkness was 11.8 milliamps, and in the light of my torch we're up to 18 milliamps, so a very pronounced difference on that particular diode. Diode D3, I thought I'd give it a try. This is one of the N plus P rather than P plus N type diodes. So diode D3 is this one here in this well. It's the same size as D13 that we started with, but it's kind of the reverse um, semiconductor materials. And you'll notice here the photoelectric effect is happening the opposite way around. So we're getting a lower current when we're shining light on it than we do without. And the last one I did here was diode D5, which is this big long one here that snakes around. This is one of the edge effect diodes. That's kind of the characteristics of those five different diodes. That's taken me hours to do and it wasn't much fun at all. So it's a couple of days since I recorded that first bit and I realised after I'd recorded it and started playing about with the diodes that I got it wrong all along and I didn't actually understand quite what photodiodes were. I'd kind of assumed they were like phototransistors and that the photo photovoltaic effect, photoelectric effect would have some influence on when the diode conducts. But it's not like that at all. And I mean, to be fair, it's a component I've never used before, but I've been wrong all this time. And now I understand what's going on, I'll show you. Hang on. What? Ah, oh, screw that. I'll just draw it by hand instead. Okay, so what's actually going on with this? The, the model for photodiodes looks something like this. We've got a diode and the current flows through it in that direction and over here we've got our solar cell photovoltaic current source effect which pushes current out through that direction and these two effects happen pretty much independently from each other I believe so with nothing attached to this thing if you just hook a multimeter across it you can read the voltage off there and you get a current flowing and the voltage across the photovoltaic effect will rise up and up and up until the point at which the diode starts to conduct which I mean I've just measured D1 here the massive one and um, I get about 0.4 volts off it and at that point that diode just starts to become conductive so the current can't rise anymore but it's like a little solar panel that's all it is it's like a solar panel there's nothing more to it superb so just a little bonus here 
Um, I figured that since photodiodes and solar panels are effectively the same thing, then I must be able to use solar panels as diodes. So these are four solar panels out of some garden lights um, that I've just hooked up as a bridge rectifier and actually each one of these is four diodes in series so I'm getting kind of 2.1, 2.2 volts voltage drop across each of those. But I've just got the mains coming into my isolating transformer and then into my variac. I've got this multimeter measuring AC voltage this measuring the DC voltage out of my bridge rectifier and I've just got a bunch of fairy lights on as a 24 volt test load and sure enough works beautifully no problem at all so if you're ever stuck for a diode you can always use solar panel neat okay so here's the setup on this chip we've got these five diodes in a row and this is supposed to be, I mean, this is a simple line scanner or direction detector so you can work out where light pulses go. And I've hooked up those four to my oscilloscope to separate traces. And what I'm going to do is try passing my green laser across the top of those diodes and see if I can capture that trace on the oscilloscope. So here's our test setup with the scope probes attached. And here's the trace we're getting at the moment. And if I just pass the green laser over the top of the chip, you'll see those lines jiggle about. So I'm going to try and capture that and see if I can get it um, halfway decent. OK, I think it just about shows up in this grab here. But you can see our yellow trace is the leading one and the first one to go. I wonder if I can stretch that out a bit. There we go. Right, there we are, now we've got our direction, so our yellow trace is the first one to get the light. Bl light blue is the second one, purple is the third one, dark blue is the fourth one, which is actually the channels 1, 2, 3, 4, and the order I've connected the diodes in. So um, we actually got a decent trace out of that. See if I can get another one. There we go, that's another nice looking one. So we've got our direction of travel there that we can see. And if I try and get one going in the opposite direction. And there we go, there's a capture of the laser going in the opposite direction across the chip. So we've got four out of the five diodes, because my scope's only got four traces. And we can see as the light hits each one of them. And I'm moving this laser so fast, I'm doing that kind of thing across it. So really quite quick response off this thing. So we can also work out the speed that the laser beam was travelling at as it went over those diodes because I had, well we know this chip is two and a half millimeters edge to edge and the laser passed across those four diodes and from the center of that diode to the center of that diode I worked it out as 0.98 millimeters so we'll call that one millimeter for convenience and then on the oscilloscope trace, from the point where the laser reaches the middle of the first diode, where it's at its brightest, till we reach the middle of the last diode, we're looking at 300 microseconds, because we're 200 microseconds per division, and we're one and a half divisions there. And doing a quick bit of number crunching on that means we may moved one millimetre every 300 microseconds. So per second, one divided by that, we move 3,333 millimetres per second, or 3.3 metres per second. Multiply that by the number of seconds in an hour, and we find we were doing, well, just about 12 kilometres an hour, or 7.4 miles an hour. And that was the speed the laser beam travelled over those diodes at. So, the next thing I wanted to have a look at was these edge diodes. And these have got the metal anode obscuring most of the diode body. So just the edges of the diode are actually reactive to light. Um, the alternative is this, which is called a deep junction diode. And these are, in fact, here's a better diagram. So these are just fairly deeply embedded in the substrate. And they're more responsive to red light. And in fact, I've got this handy graph here. Here's one I prepared earlier that depending upon the wavelength of the light depends on how far into the silicon it can penetrate. So the larger diodes are more sensitive in this region with fairly shallow penetration 
um, the edge effect diodes are more effective up in this region because blue light can penetrate further into the silicon substrate so the blue light can get in around behind this metal shield whereas the red light's blocked very early on as it tries to pass through the silicon either side. So I want to have a go with one of these edge diodes and um, my quality street wrappers and I'll see if I can notice much difference between the behaviour of blue and red light. So I'm hooked up onto pin 13 so D sorry I'm hooked up onto pin 14 so D5 I'm checking out this diode here and this is where my quality street wrappers come in. I now have a source of red light and similarly when I need it a source of blue light. So you'll have to trust me as I give you the readings here but uh, without any extra light we're reading 0 0.400 and lots of digits flashing very quickly that I can't read. With the red light on there we're up to 0.46, 458, 459 but about 4 .0 volts and if we do the same with blue light and I mean this is terribly unscientific because um, there we are, so now we're reading 0 0.48, 0 0.49, so yes, yeah, slightly more responsive to blue light. Um, as I say, this is terribly unscientific because of course this isn't going to be a pure blue, there's going to be all sorts of colours. These aren't necessarily the same um, opacity, that's probably the wrong word, but they're not necessarily letting the same amount of light pass through as each other. But I don't have a monochromator or a prism, so... I don't have any more effective way of testing that, but I'll, I'll take that as confirmation that, yeah, the data sheet's telling the truth. These edge effect diodes, which have got most of it obscured by the metal layer, are indeed slightly more sensitive to blue light. So that's about all for chip number three, folks. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I actually learned something there, because I'd always assume photodiodes were some kind of magical thing where the photo effect had some interaction with the diode switching effect and it had changed the current they switched on at or something like that voltage threshold that the diode starts to conduct at but I was totally wrong it's a diode that's also kind of like a solar cell and both effects work independently of each other so um, anyway hope you enjoyed that folks and see you next time cheers